the next one was, uh, by what are you motivated? What do you do when you get stuck or in a lull? Mm. Uh, well, the first question, I just finished a, an exhibit in New York. However, uh, I have a follow-up piece to finish, which is that one over on the wall. So I'll uh, send that to my gallery once that's done. But I also have a big commission with Nike on building a large scale piece for their on-campus collection there in Beaverton, Oregon. So the CEO I've known for a number of years, he's my biggest collector, probably owns about 13 pieces. Oh, wow. so, um, so he asked me to make a piece for this brand new building, huge building to house their art collection. I'm not sure what are the other functions of the building, but they want to um, include this art. So I'm, I'm doing a piece that's based off of the um, Nike winged victory sculpture that's very famous from uh, it's in the Louvre. Oh. So it's the the one originally from like Athens. Yeah, where it's just a pair of wings, the arm and the head, the arms and the head are missing. So he uh, wanted that piece as a central focal point. So very cool. Yeah. Um, so I have to finish that in April, right around tax time. So if I owe taxes, this will have to go for that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's pretty much just kind of the demands from your existing network, just things that you've already, mm -hmm. people that you've already worked with in the past, Yeah. asking you for more things at this point. Yeah, I mean, I always get new people to ask for work, so it's kind of a, a time-sensitive thing. Like I have another commission to finish up before the end of the year. And then next year I have, well, the big one to finish and then a couple of other actually painting portraits. So I paint as well. But the, it's I kind mean, of my hobby. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the snowball's already kind of rolling down the hill. You don't have to go and seek out mm -hmm. commission opportunities or try and, try and network more than what you've already now, it kind of comes to a point to where you know, between myself and the gallery, um, there's always a network of collectors. So apparently like there's always uh, a waiting list. So it's um, kind of a, an interesting way of keeping up with the demand, but you never really like satisfy everybody. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Um, but I'll, I'll be doing these smaller pieces that I'll put about every month or so so that we can offer to people that, you know, that don't have a budget for a big piece or, you know, have been wanting something for a long time. And so I try to consider everybody. Yeah. How many pieces do you work on at a time? Like I see you need three to work on? Yeah, I'll work on several. Uh, you know, the way I collect the materials um, like say I'll get a batch of something, you know, not all of them go into one piece, mm -hmm. like some will go into another piece and another piece. Um, so it's best to work on a family at a time. Okay. This last show, there were seven. Um, so there are specific wall spaces, so I plotted everything to fit them nicely. You don't want it to look too empty, but you don't want it to look too full. Yeah, right. So it's all about the way you present it. Mm -hmm. And things always look sharp up on the gallery wall with the light beating down on it. So. Mm -hmm. um, sorry. How did, uh, I mean, before you got the ball rolling, what was different when you first started out? You know, like how did you get this, get the snowball rolling, I guess. Because like it sounds like it's just kind of, it's kind of coming at you at this point. But before that started happening. Uh, I can probably think about it. The first time I started reaching out to galleries, um, 
galleries won't always come back with you when you email them like hey I think you like my work you know it's always like a no-no um, but I knew an artist who was showing in some galleries and I'm like well I'm your reference so do reach out to them and they'll consider you so I did that and I did hear back from, from one in Philadelphia <coughs> and um, they asked me to be a part of a group show that they were having that following summer this was in 2006 and so um, I drove a bunch of work up there for this group show and uh, I remember driving on my way there and like a few of them had already sold before the show had even, was even open and so probably from that point on like there was a demand and I did another show there there were other galleries interested in my work that were starting to see that we even got to a point where they were like fighting against each other like galleries are like they can be very territorial do you consider that to be like the turning point though from kind of yeah because I where, was where we're at compared to where you're at in yeah. your career like I was spawned out of graduate school out of Fort Hay State western Kansas they'd asked me to teach some after I was done and so I taught painting, drawing, design, figure drawing, those kinds of classes. But I'm, you know, always working, developing some kind of portfolio. And so, you know, 2006, things started happening. So at the beginning of 2007, I stopped uh, teaching. So I've done nothing else other than that since then. Um, so the two gentlemen that worked in that gallery in Philadelphia, one of them uh, split and went and opened up in New York. So that gentleman I still work with. So it's been nine some years working with him. Yeah. So it's basically your connection that could like brought you to the next level, kind of. Or yeah. They pushed you into the next level to ask this art gallery. Yeah. I mean, it's. I mean, it's not the same for everybody, but I think just visibility alone is enough for you to get into a gallery. Um, they don't always particularly care about what kind of degrees you have or you know what your a academic background is. You know, if your work is sellable, then you're in. Mm -hmm. If you're a guy off the street and you sell your work, you're you're in. So um, yeah, it's it's. I've learned that there are totally different worlds, art worlds out there. Um, and they're very hard to understand. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that's? Do you feel like that's still uh, an option, like an like a path that someone could take today? Like it, from what I'm from what I'm hearing from a lot of professors, is the galleries are kind of the the gallery world is kind of collapsing just because of technology um, there are so many other outlets for people to show their work and sell it and develop a career I mean do you feel like you know that path is still relevant, relevant? Um, I think there is limitations though um, because there isn't there isn't always you don't have direct contact to like you know corporate CEOs big huge art collectors you know they don't it's like they know this base you know all oh, this gallery is interesting you know we'll go check out what their program's about and so there are limitations but you yeah you, I mean you could certainly do things on your own I've known artists who have gotten really well established with galleries but then sort of backed out and just sort of did things on their own um, not so much selling originals alone, but selling reproductions. Mm. So they'll sell prints and do really well with that. Uh, but the nice thing about galleries is that they go up on a wall and they have an opening mm -hmm. and people want to go do that. People still like to socialize and do things and get together and yeah. celebrate that. So there's still that relevance. Um, 
you know, I, I mean, there's there's also other things. It's not just you know selling works. There's book deals. There's uh, corporate and commercial deals that you know, like right now I'm working on a some sort of collaboration with a big, huge um, television network, and you know. Like I need that gallerist guy to work on the contract, all the particulars, because um, you need to have somebody some sort of buffer, because it's you know as artist you can't always like be very knowledgeable about that. Even my gallerist isn't completely knowledgeable, but he researches, you know. So he's the guy who's taking up the time to do all that. He's wanting you to just. Like, don't worry about anything, just be in the studio. So, like, you know, it's a very nerve wracking thing. Like, oh my God, I haven't heard back from them. Like, fuck, you know, what's happening? And it's like, oh, well, you know, it's just lawyers and management, everyone's on board. The president just has to sign off on it. And so it's, it's a real, uh, it's gonna be a really interesting thing. And I've also been involved in legal things too. And so they've been able to find lawyers. And um, so there's kind of more than just, you know, making a work, do a show, sell it. Mm -hmm. So there's always. Yeah, I guess in my mind, that's kind of what I picture. It's, it seems like it, you know, there's probably a lot more to it than yeah, yeah. what I'm thinking there is. Yeah. At um, least once you're actually being recognized. Yeah, I just got a contract yesterday from a big book publisher and uh, a few weeks ago when I was in New York I met with their editor so we had a great meeting and uh, they were very receptive like we like Alice and I had approached them like you know are you interested in doing a book and you know, it's always just like Ugh. and their uh, response is really positive and gotten an uh, offer really good deal So uh, what percentage would you say your work, uh, like for selling it, um, what percentage is your work sold in like a gallery show and what percentage is your work commissioned for, like for you? Um, probably about 70 to 80% in the gallery. The rest I'll just do commissions, you know, just on my own. Mostly those are kind of more just on a local level. Uh, you have to be careful about uh, competing with your own market. So that's why galleries tend to want to have some sort of contractual agreement. So if you make a piece and um, you decide to sell it on your own with your own network of collectors who are also associated with a gallery, you're competing against your own market. So um, it can be very confusing and kind of a uh, damaging place to be. So I have a contract with a gallery. And so most things on the larger scope, you know, he handled. You know, there might be a gallery that's interested in showing my work, so they'll work out a deal to where sales are, you know, split between a percentage or sold to their gallery. So there's a gallery in LA that I do that with. So I had a show there 2014 with them. And so my gallery gets a small percentage of their sales off of that. So it's but it's all, you know, there's, there's no set in stone standard. It's just all, it's all in the negotiating table. Mm -hmm. Like what, what's the deal? How's the deal going to work? Do you have trouble keeping track of all that? I mean, just, um, it sounds like you've got a lot of, a lot of shit going on in a lot of different areas. I mean, are you responsible for keeping track of all that, all that yourself? Um, uh, not so much. Um, yeah, I'm aware of most everything that goes on. 
I'm not, <clears throat> you know, directly involved in some of the back and forth negotiation of contracts because, you know, it's not, um, there's no need to be emotionally worked up into that. Mm -hmm. You know, the gallery is always the good buffer, you know, because yeah. they'll be like, well, we're going to sell this piece for, you know, $50,000, but they're going to have to pay licensing fees. And that's always much more. And I'm like, okay, why, why would you do that? It's like, no, this is what we have to do. This is a big network, you know. It's like, okay. So you, you know, part of yourself is like, what the fuck are you doing? But then they're like, no, trust me, I'm doing the right thing. It's like, okay. <laughs> do you, um, do you, it sounds like you stress out about it, about that kind of stuff a little bit. Are you generally, I guess, are you generally stressed out about one thing or another at a, at a particular time, or are you pretty much, I mean, is it fairly easy to cope with all well, of that? Well, it's just, you know, it's a professional career, so there's always some stress level, no matter what yeah. you do. Um, but you have to always keep in mind, like, don't have expectations. Mm -hmm. There was um, there was something an offer that was that came through earlier in the year that we really thought was you know going to be a good green light, but the upper echelons of the company wanted to slash the budget by like a third, mm -hmm. and so you know it's like and that's the that's the corporate world like trying to take advantage of you. So we were like, ah, no, I'm not going to do it. And they're like, what? Really? What? You know, it's like, then they become, you know, like, it's kind of the power of saying no. Mm -hmm. It's like, you say no. You're like, what the, what? You know, then they, but, you know, in the end we said no. Like, it just wasn't worth it. Yeah. The amount of time. And, and they were very specific about how they wanted to do it. So it's just like, well, it's not going to be fun. It's not going to be worth it. You could spend the same amount of time, have a whole lot more fun, and sell something. So it's it's always um, something you have to be cautious with. Do you think that seeking gallery representation at our level of professionalism at this point would be the best way to um, gain entry into the art market, or do you think that utilization of like websites and social media is better? Uh, like I said, visibility, you know, the galleries, they're like hunters, you know, they don't like things brought to them. Like I, you know, I would show like rival galleries my work, and they're like, eh. But then the other gallery would, you know, things would do really well, and like, you know, you pass up a good opportunity. Um, but yeah, I think visibility, I think just making sure you know a very unique style, you know, your work is likable, sellable. nice to hear um, someone acknowledge that to a certain degree you should make your work sellable and likable. I feel like a lot of the people that I've talked to feel like you need to uh, you need to find yourself and put yourself into the work and that's what's <coughs> important. It needs I to be fine <coughs> you know, true yeah. to yourself and not... I don't think art necessarily needs to be personal expression. Yeah. Like I know there's a there's there's such a push in modern art like God you gotta express yourself it's you it's you 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 I'm like a lot of people that I know sell work has nothing to do with them it's like about their ideas about society politics that sort of thing you know you're not you're not trying to sell yourself in an 
our work. You're trying to sell experience. So when people see something they like, it's because they like the experience of what that artist did to make it. So I think that's how my work is done. It was done so well is that you know, this guy is really mad at Selsen about this. You know, he really enjoys this life. I want to be a part of this, support this. So. Um, yeah, I know that's kind of a an iffy thing, but you know, I'm sort of one of those people that try to look at this very selflessly. Like, like I'm not trying to sell myself. Or this work isn't about me, 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 me. Uh, yeah, I guess there's just not a whole lot of straightforwardness. Like, there's a lot of ambiguity when it comes to, especially with certain certain instructors that I that I've had have been really ambiguous about their direction and like what you should be focusing on at any particular time, you know, what like I guess what you're trying to accomplish with. It's just nice to hear someone put it in a straightforward Yeah. Way, you know. I mean I, I, I definitely think that grad school is great for just discovering who you are and how you can work and how to be um, prolific or just even uh, work ethic. So there's that aspect of it, but you know, in the gallery world, it's, I mean, it's just kind of all bets are off. Uh, I mean, there's certainly very personal work that's sold in galleries, but it doesn't always have to be that way. And so it's really, it's really kind of its own sort of science in that there's no set rules, and um, I'm always learning things all the time. I know a collector who, she loves to collect art. She was in the uh, mo uh, actor casting world. Like she got a lot of artists, or a lot of actors started. She got Robin Williams started. Really good friends with him. And so she knows that Hollywood actor world. And then her husband, really well-known music producer, he got like Pharrell Williams and James Taylor going. And then she collects art. I go, well, what, what, what's the craziest? She's like, well, it's definitely the art world. It's like, really? It's like, it's so unpredictable and strange and bizarre. It's like, really? Like Hollywood and music industry? It's like, oh, yeah. It's totally tame. Like you know where they are next and you know yeah. um, and I don't know a whole lot about the other two but yeah I would definitely say that our world is strange um, it's fascinating um, yeah always learning new things Uh, I think it's both. I was a big model builder in my adolescence. And before that, a child was super Lego junkie. So mm -hmm. um, I think that childhood experience carries over. And I think that's the playfulness of the work. It's playful, but then it's serious. You know, it's funny, but then it's... Yeah, it doesn't look playful. And on, you know, online, it looks like a really serious well thought out uh, it looks like the the person that made it takes themselves really seriously <laughs> you know i'm like the last person to take myself yeah. seriously um, yeah i think i'm very concerned about like the order but then the chaos too mm -hmm. so looking at just the individual arrangements of figures you know they're very bizarre and chaotic 
but somehow holding it all together. And that kind of plays into the philosophy that, you know, humanity is just a really wacky place, but most of the time we keep ourselves in order and follow the rules, and, but we have big emotional blow-ups, mm -hmm. and we get over it. We have emotional baggage, things that, you know, happened to us that we didn't know how to deal with, and so that changed our personality, and we have uh, vulnerabilities that we're trying to protect, so we're carrying all these weighted things down on us. You know, parents were bad to us, so I can't be like this. You know, so I try to relate that in the work, and so it's kind of a subconscious way of, you know, relating to the viewer so that they can understand that. Um, so it wasn't like a, like a conscious choice at any point where you were like, I think I'm onto something. This is the way that I'm going to, this is going to be my work. I'm going to try this out and that's going to be my thing from now on. It's just kind of, yeah, the thing is like letting go of your ego. Like, you know, it's, I felt that I had like a niche to do something. Uh, at the time I didn't take it seriously because I want to be a painter and I want to paint. Uh, <clears throat> and in that first group show that I had with this gallery, I did have other paintings. Uh, the people responded to the sculptures more. And then I realized that, you know, I, I really am naturally just a builder. I think more so than a painter or a drawer. And so I think things just work out that way. And so. Um, I think being stuck in some kind of repetitive formula treatment towards the work, which I'm always trying not to, but at the same time, there's a demand for a certain kind of look to the works, and so. Is this pretty much all you're doing now? I mean, you're, are you doing anything else that isn't anything like that? Yeah, you know, I do some concept stuff like this church tank, you know, something more minimal, or also I've done this other recent, um, I don't have it here, but uh, I did a 3D print and bronze edition of this Star Wars TIE fighter that has a capital dome on the inside. So it's a little political statement with the evil empire. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, there are things that I'll jump out of and do. Um, so there's always, you know, you don't want to freak people out too much. Um, it's still, I mean, even that, I'm looking at that, and it's still kind of anchored in that. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. At least that's what Yeah, the texture, the detail, you know, that's always kind of a thread, a common thread. Um, although I'd love someday to do very minimal work, but then again, it's like the fear of freaking people out. <laughs> Is there any concept really behind these, or are they purely aesthetic? Because they read to me as uh, religious objects, but I didn't know if there were any, I mean, we're sitting here in a church in the studio, but uh, I didn't know if there was any uh, sort of religious concept that, that was with them in that way, or is it just iconography? Yeah, I think, you know, there is sort of a spiritual feel to them. I think that's part of the, the allure. Um, but there's subtle statements there too that just you know deal with all different aspects of human psychology, and so it's sort of um I think I think they're just a shrine to you know our mental faculties, and so it's a multi-layered story. Um, a lot of the pieces in my current show have some sort of male-female interaction. One has shows the male is more aggressive towards the female, another one the female is more aggressive to that. So I always like this masculine feminine balance. And then I've done more like larger scale feminine works, but then a lot of the smaller, th smaller things are more aggressive, vice versa. There's a piece of Usher bought that was a screaming baboon that had all these little serene little angelic figures surrounding it. And so it was sort of a, you know, it's the balance. Mm -hmm. Do 
bit surreal to sell a piece to someone like that. Yeah, it is. Um, totally unexpected. But a lot of my collectors, you know, totally different professional backgrounds, totally different types of people. So I like that aspect that like my work and talk to a lot of different types of people and from all over the world. There's a woman who came all the way from Turkey. She came to the opening, she bought a piece, practically took it off the wall, flew it back with her to Turkey to put it up in Art Istanbul. Big huge art fair happening in Istanbul. And that just finished, I think, today or so. And so it's pretty wild just the you know, the expanse and the difference of collectors. I mean do you ever do you ever just sit and think like I'm famous? That's crazy. I, mean, I, I only like you're I only get that impression when I see people copying me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so when I see uh, there's always this phrase like bad art never gets copied. And so like a lot of artists that I know, I see so many people like copying them or trying to copy them. It's like you're trying to be on par with them. Like I think then it gets to the point like all right, you're well known enough to be copied, so that some some amount of fame. But you know, of course, selling works, and I mean, you could sell works to you know important people, but you know, a lot of my collectors, a lot of people I know about, it's like they don't always like to you know yell at the mountaintops like, "Oh, Guillermo del Toro bought my work. What do you think of that?" You know, it's like you don't want to. It's this. You know, discreetness, but uh, it's interesting. Like, I think there's a lot of artists out there with way more exposure than me, but don't exactly sell much. So yeah, I mean, I, it's I guess very convoluted. There's no, there's no. You know, I always try to put some sort of rationality to it. Like, man, this guy's getting like five million views, but. It's like he's not, not hardly even selling anything, and so it's it's really wild. But it's yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess my my thing is more just how it how it makes you feel, you know, to know that you've accomplished enough to where someone like Usher wants to buy something that you made. You yeah, know, if you're like. Um, ecstatic over that or if it's just like yeah I think in the early days of 2006 like I remember driving and just feeling that sensation so much like like I really want to fucking be famous you know God, I want this to happen you know it's that drive there and then it's not it's not like a you know you just wake up one day and like oh, I'm there you know it's like it's all these little gradual things that happen you know you know the, the the way it goes like this, you know, you get a lot of attention, and then it, you don't get a lot of attention, and then you get a lot of attention. So it's it's really, um, I don't know. I think there's parts of the year where I'm more famous than I am at other parts of the year. Yeah, there's never <laughs> there's never necessarily a feeling where you're like, I made it. Like this is it. I just got to keep doing what I'm doing now. I made it. Yeah, and that's always just like a. It's it's all in your head because. You know, you can live with all this expectation to get there, and you're like, ah. But then what? It's like, it's like you killed your own motivation. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, I don't have to do anything now. I'm gonna retire. You know, it's like, no, you have to keep going. You know, you have to. You want to stay there. You want to keep people interested in your work. You want to keep things exciting. And so it's, I don't know. They say it takes like ten years for an artist to really make it. And then I think, well, what about the next 10 years? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. Uh, You know, some of the fads, you know, fads go in and out really quickly. And if you're really trendy, next week you might not be. And, uh, you know, there's always legitimate concerns all the time. And I think that, you know, if I'm doing things and I'm getting copied, like, I could be, I may have a trendsetter. Oh shit, maybe that's bad because, you know, next year that trend might not be popular and so it's always a worry. But um, I think no matter what, just always 
keeping the work ethic and making work and always pushing yourself to do your thing. People are always going to admire that. Yeah, I, I even look at a lot of my older work. I'm like, God, why the hell did I do that? Oh, that was crap. So you think, oh, well, somebody bought it, so it's fine. Mm -hmm. so. Um, typically, I don't know, sometimes I'll, I'll travel somewhere just to collect things. The last week I was in New Mexico, I gave a talk at Las Cruces University of New Mexico, but I didn't bring any work with me. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll do things like that. Um, but I was, early in the year I was in LA working with a company that was uh, photographing a piece. Um, but then I'm there and have children, so there's demands there. There's like places we go with that. Uh, but usually when we do that, I try to like mix a little bit of the business with it just to you know make it all worthwhile. But, um, so would that make it like you're doing like a 30 70 day kind of thing, like 30 percent tracking and, and maybe 10 percent calling and plugging in? Yeah, that's that's a dangerous thing for an artist. Like you can't take them out of their studio for very long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's the sabotaging thing. your future. Yeah. <laughs> that's the thing that I was curious about. Like how how do you balance your your time? You know, like for me, I really value my personal life. As I see it as separate from, kind of at least a little bit separate from what I'm doing here. You know, and I really value that time. I don't know if it sounds like people that um, I talk to that, you know, if you want to make it, you've got to just be working all the time. You know, it seems like I get yeah, I don't know. I, a lot. I think breaks are good though, because mm. you could be working out, working a lot, and you really get burned out, and you're forcing yourself, and you're forcing yourself. But I've felt really refreshed like not doing anything for like two weeks it's like you know it's like oh well, I gotta gotta get back but mm -hmm. then you get back and then it's like oh you know like today I'm relaxing with my family and I don't have ideas and you know I'm just like sitting there and almost drifting asleep and then I get this amazing idea like oh you know yeah, I, I probably wouldn't have that had I been in the studio all day you know mm -hmm. so um yeah, I do have to balance between here and a family life, <clears throat> but it's hard because I'll I'll be with my family, and I'm still thinking like, oh, I gotta finish this piece, and it's hard to separate the two. It's a real, um, I don't know. Do you feel like you get enough time with them? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, it's all about a daily schedule. Mm -hmm. When they know when to see you. As long as you're not interrupting that, you know, they don't feel abandoned. <laughs> do you ever bring work home? Or do they have the little ones you play or something? Or well, not collaborate, but like, do they show them what you're doing? No. I always try to keep that separate. Yeah. My son loves to come here because this is like ultra playground for him. Mm, true, true. He's like fanatical about Star Wars right now. So anything doing with that, he's mm. just like blowing up four years old so um <clears throat> and there are things that i'll do for them like i built them a spaceship for christmas last year so i built it here mm -hmm. during a time i didn't have to do anything i'll probably build something again this year i'll make time for it mm -hmm. so it's yeah again it's a balance good is it really nice to have a whole different Yeah, I don't think I've ever had a studio where I've lived. Um, I don't know how that would go. My wife is really interested in this house that's north of town. It's huge. It's like 4,000 square feet. And the whole bottom layer is prime studio area. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know if I want that close access because, mm -hmm. you know, you really, as an artist, you have to be in your studio for long hours of time. Uninter uninterrupted 
Yeah, they're like hitting the zone. And like you go down, you're just sorry, and then like you know. your couch is right upstairs. Yeah, or your child just busts open the door. You know, is crying about something. And like, Ugh. So that's that could be a very hard thing. So I, she's all on board about moving into this place. We know that people who live there. I just like, I don't know. I, I don't know if I could do that. You're more comfortable with treating this <coughs> like this building is a job, and you have to drive here and. Yeah. schedule that uh, I like that it's not very far away my house is just a few blocks this way yeah but you actually so. have to make the conscious effort to get in your car leave be yeah. here and then if you want to go home you actually have to go home rather than yeah. go upstairs somewhere yeah. along the way the transformation happened like okay now I'm in work mode yeah and I'll be the, the person who, like I stare at the clock mm-hmm. and I'll work up right to the final minute if I have to like like, okay, I can make it home in two minutes. Like, glue out the door. Mm-hmm. So, I have to savor that time. Uh, which I think is good, because I, I think I'm actually more productive married with children than when I was single. Yeah. I felt that when I was single, it was just, just goofed off a lot, you know. I'm working at it. Yeah. I mean, I, I can still get a lot of work done, but something about pockets of concentration work better instead of just it's a weird feeling when I do have free days I'm just here all day and like you know sometimes it always doesn't doesn't always flow well like work all day and doesn't like something and then like feel like you've lost the whole day Uh, you don't just have days where you I have to force myself to do that because after when when you're working on a show like you're up for days hardly able to sleep put the show up it's a term sometimes shows up the after show blues where you just feel like uh like i should be making more work but i really need to take a break I have taken it easy since that, but here I am now. Like, and right around the time my show came out, this new opportunity has been boiling. So I don't know when that it could happen at any point that I get the phone call like, right? "All right, you got to start the speech. You only have one month." Good. And then everything has to feel on pause. But but then again, uh, you know, I can't have expectations like, you know, this network president might be like, ah, we can't do that, or don't want to do that. So it's like, but everything always works out. So you, you talked about um, like making time in the studio a lot, un- uninterrupted, and but you also said that sometimes you employ. That's a balance too, because I'll start my day and I'll have helpers come in. So I help them map out everything. And they work up to a certain time of the day, which is three o'clock, then they leave. So then I have three more hours just in my own solitude. So you know, a lot of it is just um, Constructing things on a pragmatic level. It seems like in the afternoon, and they say this about the human brain, like your best optimal performance is in the afternoon. Like you've reached this point in the day where your brain gets like the best ideas. And so I try to time it to where I can be alone during that time and I can just blurt out goofball stuff and not think that somebody thinks I'm crazy. I always try to stay pretty tame when people are here but when they leave I'll get kind of wacky and so I'm a little shy about that
said we were painters first, right? Mhm. Mm and then we used gold a little bit better. Like we just want the hobby and then we turned it into business. Yeah. Just like Vancey? Yeah, like I said, I didn't take it very seriously at first. Um, although I loved doing them, it was like my adolescence grown up into mm -hmm. something serious. Mm -hmm. I did my first one probably in 1995. Mm -hmm. Everybody loved it. And then 2004, I had a friend encourage me to make one. Really liked it, I had parts left over so I made another one. People really liked that. So I'm like, all right, I'm gonna make a seven foot tall one. So I made that, put in some shows. Um, then it just kinda kept going and I still paint though. I've mm -hmm. done a few paintings this year. So just what does that make your hobby now? So if this is your business, what do you do with this hobby? Um, yeah, do you have leisure time? I mean, do you have what you would consider? Um, I love museums. I love going to museums. Um, architecture too. I think my hobbies are, you know, still in some ways related to my work. You know, going out and getting inspiration. Um, but as far as like any active hobbies. <coughs> Other than building spaceships for my children, you know, mm -hmm. maybe that. <laughs> <coughs> I sometimes find myself, I'll be bored with something. I'll be at home and just maybe just looking at it. I'll want to crochet and I'll sit and do it with my hands. Mm -hmm. And would you say that that, like this, your work with your hands working versus the doing the job kind of thing? Um. Like going to work versus Huh. I guess I'd say that that is my job, keeping my hands busy, but <coughs> I mean there's like things to do at home and things to do with the children to take care of. Mm -hmm. That's always like a busyness, like Okay. I guess that's part of my thing. I have to busy it so I don't know. Yeah. Um, like today I had such a huge urge to rake up the leaves in my lawn, but I took a nap instead. <laughs> Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, I have a little cough. Mm -hmm. Safe to sleep in, fortunately. Mm -hmm. The uh, the one last thing that I was really curious about um, was now that you're here, what long term goals do you have? Like, what would you like to be doing in ten years? Um, my ultimate thing is to build a museum or some sort of structure that houses a collection of my work that's there after I'm gone. Um, Salvador Dali's house is a museum and it's really eccentric so I kind of idealized with that. Um, so I think at some point soon in my life, I want to establish what that's going to look like. This house that my wife is really interested in is <coughs> probably could fit that. Um, you know, instead of the idea of trying to go to the art world to get into museums, like, you know, trying to reach out that way. My approach is create it within and then people will come. So my idea is to, to build a structure. It's all about location, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna build it way out in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> which is how Dolly's house is. It's really way out in the middle of nowhere in this tiny village on the coast of Spain. But he has another museum in a city in Spain that you can get to, but um, yeah, there's that. The long-term goal. That That is nothing like what I thought that you would say. Really? I would never have expected you to answer that question that way. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Thank you. 
that's a lofty in my in my mind like from where i'm sitting that would be a really lofty goal you know? I, I think it's about creating the atmosphere of your work because you can create <coughs> windows of your work that get sold off or whatever so something about i like the idea of an encapsulated environment you could walk into that that was this guy's mind like going into dolly's house like like you just feel surreal like why the hell would you do this and the studio is only like a quarter of the size of this room and he made gigantic paintings in them like how is that even possible but then he has like this long thin swimming pool in his backyard that has these throne chairs at one end and there's a, a lighthouse glass bulb in between them you know it's like I just love that eccentric side to it um, yeah I really felt like you know be an active artist always you know creating selling works but in the meantime, developing this place. That's why I like places like Hearst Castle, what uh, Citizen Kane was inspired by. Um, I haven't been there, but I have a book on it. Like, I just love that. You know, it's a collection of buildings on this big estate. And it's this own little world. And it's a relic, and it's a museum, and People visit it, get inspired by it. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering what advice you would give to a aspiring or young artist as far as getting exposure. Um, yeah, it's all about the visibility. Um, and I think just creating style, uh, perfecting your style, finding what that is, making sure you're not copying somebody else. Um, yeah, visibility and just, you know, it's that wonderful tool of social media that helps. And, uh, you know, there's always these tiers of art platforms that are featuring artists for a day, you know, make a post and then you'll get likes and then, you know, eventually the gallery starts digging your work. Um, I think work ethic, style, um, and then networking. Yeah, I think for me, more so that's architecture styles. Um, I just love form and shape. Okay. Um, so you still do that kind of thing with stencils? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anything else? That's, uh, I got all the questions that I wanted answered answered and I'm I'm glad we did this in your studio because that was another thing I wasn't sure where we were where we were going but this is awesome mm -hmm. just to see someone that has developed a career what their space looks like <laughs> you know yeah my gallerist did come here to visit about a year ago and he walks in he's like you know how many New York artists would just kill to have a space like this and it's true um when I was in New York, I did some studio visits, and you know, artists I know, work is really great, it's big. They go into a studio, and it's like the size of that area back in there. I'm like, wow, this, you know, it's like it was nice, mm -hmm. but he was so excited because it was so much bigger than his last studio. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, 
the previous studio that I was in was like three times the size, but one floor is like showroom, mm. so it was just that. Another one was just like spillover storage, didn't really do much, and then the basement was where I worked, so that was about the size. But I, the previous studio to that was only about a third of the size. I was still able to make a lot of work in there, but as a sculptor, like storage becomes an issue. Mm. So I have all this room, stuff everywhere, there's stuff up there. But then I, I rent another space that has tons and tons of totes full of stuff. Uh, it's too much. I got to move out of that one. It's just too much. But do you uh, do you own this building? No, I rent it. Oh, you John Hockmeister owns it. Okay. And he also owns this other place over on uh, East Eighth, three thirteen. It's like an old repair, garage repair place. So it's like these units with garage doors on them. Yeah, he's Sorry, talked right about he, he's talked about uh, different properties that he, I guess that he owns. And I never really, never really understood what the what the arrangement with you and him was. Oh, yeah, I just went from. He saw this place for sale, and uh, he's like, "Hey, if I buy it, will you rent from me?" Like, well, let's go look. I came here and looked, and yeah, I think it's gonna do really well. There's other churches in the area. There's actually a church down on Lincoln that's for sale. It's bigger than this, but the windows are much smaller. So it's like a, a weird trade-off. Mm -hmm. Like you could have a bigger space, but less natural light. Mm -hmm. So I think the staying here is fine. Cool. Yeah. Cool, man. Thank you yeah. for. Um, Thank you. I mean, did everybody yeah. get what they wanted? Yeah. Thank you for...